Hello students, welcome to Environmental Health, the last lecture. We are going to talk today about vitamin D and vitamin D deficiency. Hope you enjoy the lecture. Believe it or not, this is actually the second time I'm recording this lecture. The first time I went through and my new microphone didn't work. So now I'm back to my old microphone, so I hope that this one works well. <laughs> So take a look at this. There is this study here. It was done in Maine. They surveyed 800,000 people and they found that one in five had had a test for vitamin D blood levels in the last three years. What is going on? Turns out that many of them have gone to the doctor's office and complained about things like malaise or fatigue. And so it seems to be this impression that vitamin D has something to do with those particular conditions. You can see the results are reporting back that most people had these normal levels in their blood, but the lab results were classifying them as insufficient. Hmm. So let's talk about that, and let's take a look and see at what uh, some of the uh, scientific papers are reporting. So here's a quote from a New York Times con uh, science contributor. You can see what she says here. She says, millions of people are popping supplements in the belief that vitamin D can help turn back depression, fatigue, muscle weakness, even heart disease or cancer. In fact, there has never been widely accepted evidence that vitamin D is helpful in preventing or treating any of those conditions. Hmm, makes you think. I did a quick Google search when I started putting together this topic, and you can see all sorts of infographics like this that are claiming that we are not getting enough vitamin D. This one is talking about vitamin D decrease in the past few decades. Here's another one that seems to be inferring that uh, vitamin D deficiency is like an iceberg. It's talking about here at the top of the iceberg, we understand that extreme deficiencies lead to bone issues such as rickets, we'll talk about that shortly. But it's indicating that there's a whole host of problems that are caused by vitamin D deficiency that we are not really understanding well. So click to learn more if you want to go check out that website. We're going to talk about these issues. Here's another one. This website has all sorts of claims. Vitamin D deficiency is going to help you with hair loss, fatigue, excessive sweating, yay, depression, muscle weakness, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, multiple sclerosis, and autism. Huge list. Many of these things have multiple or unknown causes. So, of course, vitamin D is going to take care all for all of them. I believe that's what people are thinking. Interesting stuff. Let's see what some of the research is saying. Just a quick uh, search in PubMed for vitamin D deficiency. I got some papers. You can see this one says, vitamin D deficiency, an ignored epidemic. Here's another one, the vitamin D deficiency pandemic. Oh, I bet you we all love that word right now. We're hearing all about pandemics. That means a worldwide problem. Is there really a pandemic? Okay, some question marks here. Here's another one. Is the pandemic real? So lots of people have weighed in on this particular issue. And that's what we're going to attempt to discuss here today in this lecture. So what is vitamin D? So vitamin D is a vitamin. That means it's a nutrient that is essential for the human body and it's essential in calcium absorption. So therefore, it has a pretty significant role in bone and teeth to develop it. Uh, there are also vitamin D receptors on our immune cells. And uh, unfortunately, at the moment, we, you know, scientists don't really know what that means. It probably means there's something that vitamin D has to do with the immune system. But at the moment, it's all speculation. So here's vitamin D here. This is what we are taking if you take vitamin D supplements. This is actually one of the vitamin D compounds, vitamin D3. Uh, there are other compounds here. You can see ergosterol. Uh, that's a plant uh, precursor. And uh, these other ones are basically precursors. So vitamin D2 is converted by your body into vitamin D3. This is converted by the sun. I'll kind of show you that in the next slide. These are all uh, uh, sterols, by the way. We have uh, one, two, three, 
four rings that makes these sterols, these compounds, uh, as, as a classification. So take a look. There is the precursor, and the sun, UV light, will take this compound and convert it. So this chemical bond here is broken. You can see it is broken here now, and we have this precursor. And then our body actually has an enzyme to do the last step. So there we go. We can make vitamin D3. So where else do we get vitamin D besides access to sunlight in our diet? So we consume cheese, milk, eggs, fish, yogurt. All these things can and usually do have some sort of vitamin D in them. Here's a better list. Take a look carefully at this list in terms of the amount of vitamin D in these food products. So take a look here uh, at salmon, trout, cod liver oil. So fish products seem to have a lot of vitamin D. You can see that cod liver oil there has quite a few units just in one teaspoon. This seems to be something that kids would take all the time, a teaspoon a day. Apparently it tasted awful, but this was uh, um, a measure by parents to try to get their kids to get enough vitamin D to prevent rickets. Something else I wanted to point out is that a number of these products, these uh, milk products, so this is fortified milk, you can see up here has a decent amount of vitamin D in it. Goat's milk, fortified, has a decent amount of vitamin D. So nowadays in the modern world, and at least countries in cooler climates, we tend to uh, fortify a lot of our foods, typically our milk products, uh, with a vitamin D. Other products, you can see up here we've got orange juice fortified with vitamin D. Fruits and vegetables generally have very little vitamin D, uh, if at all, uh, unless they're actually fortified. So meat products, particularly the uh, fish products, are the best for you, and fortified other products. Most of our dairy products are fortified, as where we're going to get vitamin D other than from the sunlight. So I mentioned rickets, rickets being a bone disorder. This is a disorder that uh, is from a vitamin D deficiency. We've known about rickets for a long, long time. I'm not sure exactly when the connection between vitamin D and rickets was discovered, but basically the bones are kind of soft because they're not mineralized properly. And uh, you can see here that uh, normally we have a nice straight bone. This one here, because of gravity, gets bent. And of course, you know, some deformations in children that have rickets. This is why people were eating that cod liver oil, because once we found out the connection between vitamin D, we just found a source of vitamin D and started feeding it to kids. And that actually got rid of rickets uh, in a lot of uh, developing countries at the time. Another condition that's associated with vitamin D is this here, uh, osteoporosis or osteomalacia. I'm not sure actually what the difference between osteomalacia and osteoporosis is, but basically it's a demineralization of the bones. Uh, more characteristically in women that are post-menopause, post-menopause women are making less estrogen and that seems to have something to do with uh, calcium uptake uh, and there's a connection with uh, vitamin D in there. So these things here, you can see the bone development is very well understood for vitamin D. All these other things here, these are more question marks in that there's some connections or correlations with vitamin D in terms of what is going on. Lots of these things are proposed. You can see uh, we really don't know. Bone development for sure. These other things, there is research on it, but many correlations, not necessarily causations. So another variable with vitamin D intake is vitamin D toxicity. So vitamin D is actually taken in by fat cells uh, because it's a fat soluble vitamin. You can see from the structure that it's uh, very hydrophobic. And uh, so if people take excess doses, it actually gets stored in the fat. And uh, there are studies showing that it can lead to issues uh, in the kidneys where it basically will calcify uh, vessels and uh, cause issues there. And uh, so this is a concern. If people are taking way too much vitamin D, are they actually going to take it to toxic levels? Very important uh, question to ask. Of course, there is the internet, and the internet will tell you otherwise. You can see this person here, apparently a vitamin D researcher. He says, worrying about vitamin D toxicity is like worrying about drowning when you're dying of thirst. I'm not sure where he's getting his information, but uh, we're going to talk about this. 
So let's take a look at this study here. This is an important study done about 10 years ago. Uh, this study was commissioned by Health Canada, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and actually quite a number of American uh, government agencies, and they wanted to review the DRAIs, so DRIs, that's Daily Recommended Intake, for vitamin D and calcium, so they're related. And uh, basically it was a meta-study where they looked at uh, nearly a thousand published studies. So this is what they found, kind of overall, we'll delve into a little bit more of the data. And it says here, the evidence surrounding the role of calcium and vitamin D in bone health was judged to be convincing. So we've already discussed that. That was a no-brainer. We've known that for quite a long time. And uh, so this is what they're looking at that, uh, in order to base their recommendations on uh, daily recommended intake of vitamin D. So what else did they find? So this is what they concluded, that most Americans and Canadians are getting enough vitamin D and calcium. Uh, and this was the recommended daily dose is 600 international units. I'll talk about that in a moment. So this was their, uh, their data that they produced and I'm assuming all of you are in this category of children or adults between the ages of 9 and 70. So they're recommending 600 international units. So for some reason we like to measure vitamins in units. This is 15 mcg. That's micrograms. So micro -gram 15. So that's the conversion for you. With the maximum dose, you can see a 4,000 international units. So think about that number 4,000, kind of, and we'll come back to it. So this was their uh, recommended levels that they found, and I'll, um, I'm going to show you some data that's using these numbers. So they're saying that you know if you look at the blood, uh, 50 nanomoles per liter of blood is good enough. Uh, 30 to 50 is sort of in that wiggle zone of maybe that person has some deficiencies. And then if you are lower than 30, then you probably have a, a risk for rickets or osteomalacia. The committee did look at a number of other risks. So they looked at cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and immunity. And this was their conclusion. They found that the data was inconsistent and does not demonstrate a cause and effect relationship. So I guess a big question mark still for these things here. Probably, probably not, uh, not significant data anyway. So I want to take a look at another study that was based on that uh, initial 2010 study. This was, you can see, published in 2012-2013. And uh, they were taking a look at Canadians and basically taking blood samples. So if you take a look at this chart, we have the three categories. We have the greater than 50 nanomoles per liter. We have the uh, you know sort of gray zone, 30 to 50, and then the deficiency zone, which is less than 30. So if you take a look at this, this is uh, divided by age, but overall this is the finding that 65% of Canadians were in good shape. 10% of Canadians probably deficient, and that means about 25% of us are kind of in that gray zone, probably maybe not getting quite enough. Another thing they looked at was racial background. Okay, this is kind of interesting. Let's take a look at white people and let's take a look at other people, meaning darker skin. Uh, it turns out that if you have darker skin, this can be an issue for you getting vitamin D. It turns out darker skin has more pigment and that pigment actually prevents UV light from penetrating the skin and producing vitamin D in the skin. So it's true, people of darker skin colors uh, are at higher risk of having uh, vitamin D deficiencies as shown in this particular study. You can see it's much higher. You can see white people, the deficient category, that's what, maybe about 5 or 6 percent. Whereas uh, people with darker skin, I'm not exactly sure how they classify this, but you're looking at maybe 20 percent of these individuals are at a deficiency and another 30, let's say 37, 38 percent are kind of in that gray zone with not even 50% being uh, having quite enough. So if you have darker skin, I guess that's none of us, uh, then maybe you should consider taking supplements. So 
So if you're concerned about your vitamin D exposure, obviously your diet is going to have a big part of this. If you're vegan, uh, you're going to probably want to have supplements uh, depending on you know what type of diet you have, whether you uh, have fortified milk or not. I think most vegans are not eating uh, milk products, uh, but uh, again, that's part of your diet. I found this uh, particular uh, website here. I encourage you to go check it out. It's kind of an interesting little website to check out where it can estimate how much vitamin D you're getting at different times of the year. So take a look at this. I tried uh, two settings, one for March 27th, so that's today's date. And I also tried basically midsummer, so I figure, okay, let's try July 27th. That's uh, sometime in the peak of summer when there's lots of sun and I'm probably going to be outside. Uh, I typed in the latitude for Fort McMurray and longitude for Fort McMurray so you can uh, figure out where you are on the planet. You can look at your skin type. I think if I remember correctly, they had six skin types. I estimate from the descriptions that I'm a skin type 2, so I'm not extremely fair, but I'm not that dark. I'm pretty light. Uh, if you are um, you know, African Canadian, uh, you're a 5 or a 6. There's different shades of people who are from African descent, obviously, and there's a few shades in between. So also looking at midday exposure to sun. So take a look at this. This is for March 27th. So I estimated I would have maybe about 10% of my body being exposed. So figure my head. Is that 10%? I don't know. Uh, but that's the guess. Overcast sky. Uh, I looked outside. The concrete's looking wet. I don't have any grass or anything like that. So this is saying that it would take 34 minutes for me to make that 600 units. So again, it really depends on whether 600 units is sufficient or not. And of course, it depends on whether I'm getting any vitamin D in my actual diet or not. So let's take a, July, a look at July 27th. July 27th, I figured, you know what, body exposure 50%. I'm probably outside a lot more. I'm probably uh, wearing a t-shirt, maybe shorts. I'm figuring the sky is probably cloudless, a lot more sun in July. And I'm out in the backyard in the grass. So this, it says, will take two minutes for me to get enough vitamin D. Notice the note here, sunscreen will probably affect this, but hey, two minutes doesn't sound that bad. I won't even get burnt in two minutes. So I wanted to show you something else. Uh, this was done by a group called Pure North. I'll talk about them in a moment. They use the same tool, and they're in Calgary, and they came up with slightly different numbers. So Calgary, July 30th, so pretty similar date, and they're saying one minute for somebody with skin of type 3. And they're estimating actually 75% body exposure, so maybe they're wearing more skimpy clothes than I do. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't take very long. Uh, this was the interesting thing I found that, uh, so they were looking at November. I never did look at November. I looked at March because I wanted to do today's date. And they're saying it'll take you two hours and 42 minutes if you have a skin type 3 in Calgary to get enough uh, sunlight. Body exposure 15%. So check out the uh, check out the calendar. It's uh, kind of in, or calendar calculator. Check it out. It's kind of interesting to experiment with and see uh, what kind of uh, uh, exposure values you're going to get. So, as I mentioned, there is disagreement about these things. Uh, so there have been at least a few studies that have followed up that 2010 study. Uh, some of them have agreed wholeheartedly with the 2010 findings, and there's one big one that disagreed. You can see these people here, they're from the University of Alberta. So interesting, let's see what they have to say. So they said that the work made a serious calculation error. Did help Canada make a, a math error? And they are saying that we need 8,900 international units instead of 600. Wow. Um, some researchers disagreed. Others agreed with the initial analysis. You can see here what it says here. Health Canada uh, made a reassessment and they stand by their values. You can take a look at this paper. I have some of the uh, uh, graphs on the PowerPoint slides. I'm not going to go through it in any significant detail. Uh, I admit that the uh, amount of statistics they use in there is a little bit beyond my understanding. Uh, I am going to go with Health Canada on this one. I figure they've taken a pretty good look at the numbers, and they probably know what they're doing. 
Um, I did look at the stats in the paper, and it, you know, I, I understand that there is room for interpretation. But I also believe that probably no one on the planet is getting 8,900 8, international units of vitamin D unless they live at the equator. And that being said, Canadians are a pretty healthy bunch. So I don't believe that that number is something uh, that we should be going for. So let's talk about that Pure North. Of course, they have their opinion. They are an advocacy group for vitamin D, believe it or not. And you can see that they are talking about, they said, Health Canada made a mathematical error. So they're blaming, uh, they're saying that report is wrong and that many Canadians are, in fact, deficient. You can check out their website if you like. There are many, many groups on this. I do encourage you to check out their video. Uh, it is very typical of these kind of videos. They have a doctor in the lab coat, and they sound really official and all that. And uh, and it's it's like many of these things that we've looked at uh, over the past year on uh, on some of these scientific controversies. And uh, anyway, check it out. You can see what they're saying. Like I said, I I don't necessarily agree with them. I think I'm going to stick with Health Canada on this one. Look at this, 15,000 international units, isn't that kind of crazy? I don't think we should be uh, uh, going for those kind of levels. It sounds pretty unhealthy to me. Uh, here's another author. Uh, this is a writer for the Global Mail, and he is uh, writes a lot on vitamins. And he says, taking megadoses is not only unwarranted, it may be unsafe. Good job, Fred. Let's err on the side of caution. So I want to talk a little bit about how this may have begun. I tried to do some research on this, and you can see it's talking about the year 2000. Uh, and uh, a bunch of papers started coming out and looking at levels in there uh, of, of vitamin D in the blood. And uh, some people started to wonder about some things like multiple sclerosis. We'll talk about that in a moment. And mental illness. These things were, of course, were a lot more on the radar in the year 2000 than they were in previous years. So this seems to be where it all began in 2007 with this guy here, an MD, Michael Hollick. He published a paper in the New England uh, Journal of Medicine. That's a pretty important medical journal. And he asserted that these normal blood levels of vitamin D, so 21 to 29 nanograms per mil, were linked to an increase of a whole bunch of things. Cancer, autoimmune diseases, diabetes, schizophrenia, depression, and a number of other things. Again, like I said, these are things that have multiple and not necessarily fully understood causes. So linking vitamin D to them uh, does sound a lot more like speculation than anything else. So there was a committee he was on in 2011 that came up with recommendations. And of course, they recommended higher than that, 30 nanograms per milliliter. And that, of course, classified most people in the United States as deficient. And, of course, the press and all sorts of advocacy groups have latched onto this and have made that the recommendation. So now we have these commercial labs that talk about these normal levels of 20 to 30 mils. They talk about those insufficient. Let's just take a look at a few recent studies on this and see what they've said. So notice this, we have a 2017 study of more than 5,000 participants. So take a look at my note up here. Many of these studies are considered too small to be definitive. So how big of a study do we need on this? Again, this has to do with cancers and things like that where you really need to have huge populations to understand what's going on and never mind dealing with all, all the confounding variables. This particular study says that vitamin D did not prevent uh, heart attacks, at least from 5,000 people question is if that's enough people to actually study. Here's another study with more than 2,000 people, and it says here they were looking at postmenopausal women, and it did not protect the women against cancer. Here's another study in The Lancet. So The Lancet is a very big medical journal. This is looking at 53,000 people. This is actually a meta-study. And you can see that there, from their findings, it had no effect on preventing bone fractures, at least in healthy individuals. People with uh, clear deficiencies and rickets obviously would have issues. What I want to point out is the response of the researcher. He says, 
it adds to the narrative that experts don't agree. That happens all the time, experts don't agree. Perhaps people aren't interested in getting to the truth of the story. Interesting and insightful. Here's another study, a Danish study. More than 200,000 individuals. This is huge. This takes a lot of money to do studies like this as well. So this particular study uh, followed uh, quite a few people over several years and then followed them up for 10 years. So notice they were looking at blood levels. So this is actually a pretty quantitative kind of study. Uh, during the follow-up period, uh, many people were diagnosed with cancer, so 18,000 cases of cancer. So this is pretty good statistics-wise to look at uh, at cancers. Of course, there's many different types of cancers out there, as we've, as we've discussed already. So here are the findings. They actually found an increase, an increase in certain types of cancers due to 10 nanomoles per liter. Interesting. 5% decrease in the risk of lung cancer. So interesting, I haven't actually taken a very careful look at this study, but it's one study of many, this one has found an increase. I'll show you a very important study in a moment that actually shows some decreases. Again, they claim it's not significant enough. So this is the big study that uh, a lot of people have been talking about, and the results, and believe it or not, were actually only published last year. This is the vital study. They were looking at vitamin D, so vital, V, vit for vital, and omega, AL, uh, three uh, fatty acids. So this was a control of 25,000 or so people. They were all older than 50, so people in high risk groups for various types of diseases, and they were taking supplements of 2,000 international units. Some people criticize that this is not enough, that they should be taking 5,000 units. Uh, again, you know, there's always controversy with these studies. People can't seem to even agree on what the recommended amount is going to be. So four groups. One group had vitamin D and fish oil. That has the omega fatty acids in it. One group had vitamin D only, and a fish oil placebo. Third group had a vitamin D placebo and fish oil. And then the last group was just placebo and placebo. So they looked for reduced risk of mostly cancer, heart disease, and stroke. These were the things they were looking at. Time period. So this is quite a few years, average of five years. That's enough time to develop those kind of diseases. Okay, so let's take a look here. Uh, the placebo group had 824 cases of cancer, and the vitamin D group had 793. So that's a small reduction. Uh, they concluded, uh, looking at the data, that it was not significant. No reduction in breast, prostate, or colorectal cancers, but basically the big three, right? Interestingly enough, there was a reduction, a significant reduction, in the population that will consider themselves African Americans. So this is huge. This is significant. This actually confirms what we've talked about before, in that African Americans may in fact be um, vitamin D deficient on a more, more average than uh, people with lighter skin. Uh, the connection with cancer was, was not necessarily expected uh, by by some people because there's been weak links with cancer and vitamin D, but in this case it does seem to show that uh, Africans may actually uh, benefit from taking vitamin D supplements. The other interesting thing is even though it didn't really decrease the amount of cancer too much, at least in, in most of the people, it did decrease the amount of cancer deaths. So there might be some benefit into taking vitamin D supplements. At least if you have cancer, uh, it may help prevent you from dying from it or having more serious disease. What about cardiovascular disease? So again, take a look. 409 heart attacks or strokes or deaths and 396 in the vitamin D group. Again, a small, non-significant reduction. So small reduction. What about side effects? They did not actually find many side effects. Again, they remember they're only taking 2,000 international units, uh, nothing that would be considered too high. Remember that Health Canada was recommending that the maximum was 4,000 international units. So what about those omega fatty acids? You can read about this. Uh, they did show the, a bit of a lower risk for heart attacks and a slight uh, increased risk of certain types of cancers. 
um, but I don't really want to go into the details here because we really are focusing on vitamin D. So some last thoughts about vitamin D, something you may have heard about is that uh, there are a number of people that have postulated a, a link between vitamin D deficiency and multiple sclerosis. So take a look at this uh, graph on the right. So right here we have the equator. If you live at the equator, your risk for multiple sclerosis is almost zero. As you go north, so there's the equator. As you go north or south, so you get to countries like up here in the north, we're talking about Canada, uh, Siberia, uh, Scandinavian countries, Denmark, and so on, you have more cases of multiple sclerosis per capita. You go south, we're talking about extreme south, Argentina, and uh, New Zealand, you get more cases of multiple sclerosis. So there's definitely a correlation between latitude and multiple sclerosis and possibly vitamin D levels. Again, this is a correlation, not a causation, but it is something that a lot of people have been discussing for quite a number of years now. Uh, multiple sclerosis, unfortunately, we have no idea what the cause is. Uh, you can take a look at the scientific literature on that. There's actually quite a number of hypotheses around it. It could be other environmental chemicals uh, or other things that are going on in um, in countries at higher latitudes. You know, I mean, just think about all of the uh, all of the possible causes. So something we may hear about in the future. Uh, last thing about this is to say that multiple sclerosis um, is an autoimmune disease. So this may have something to do with those immune receptors. Uh, that uh, those immune cell receptors that do take in vitamin D, but we're not really sure. So this is the end. This is the end of all environmental health lectures. I hope you enjoyed the class. I really uh, appreciated all of you guys and the opinions and thoughts that you have taken to class. It's been a lot of fun. Um, this computer stuff has been a little weird. Uh, having one-way conversations with myself, talking to a computer screen has not been ideal, but I do appreciate all the things that you guys have, uh, have brought to class. So hopefully you have a wonderful summer. Hopefully you stay healthy and your families are well. And uh, if all goes well, I will see you around in the fall. And uh, take care of yourself. That's all for now.